How can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. My name is Annie Silverman. I'm a printmaker and sometimes a book artist and a teacher. And I have been the owner of Abrazos Press, which is a professional and educational print shop in Somerville, Massachusetts for 13 years. I teach classes there. They're small classes. I teach uh, different types of relief printmaking and mixed media printmaking and sometimes book arts. I've been, I feel like I've been an artist my whole life, but I didn't grow up in a family that acknowledged that. So I went to art school when I turned 30. I had a history history degree and a master's in education. And I was always just hungry to learn more. And I remember going to an evening workshop with a woman who was a fiber artist she was getting a master's in fiber and I didn't even know such a thing existed. And I went home and I remember sitting on my floor crying, thinking, I really want to do this. And, but I always thought, well, I don't know if I'm good enough. And my parents never went to college. Like I'm the first generation to go to college and they didn't know any artists. And so I started to take continuing education classes at Mass College of Art. And then I applied to the fiber program. And then from there, I, I became a paper maker and I made sculpture with Japanese paper. And I had an experience where I was a pulp slave at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in 1984. And the person that had that class was Bernie Toll and Marilyn Pappas, who taught at Mass College of Art. And then Bernie had a paper making studio and he didn't want to teach a papermaking class at Mass Art anymore. And I said, I'll teach it if you want. And then that was my entree into teaching at the college level, you know, that somebody was nice to me and they knew I was a good teacher from that experience at Haystack. So I started to teach papermaking at Mass Art and I did that for about eight or nine years. And then at some point I discovered printmaking. I also taught writing. I taught writing at UMass Boston for people that were going to be teachers So I've kind of stirred in this pot of printing, paper, books, writing for a long time, you know, both with my own work and just, you know, teaching people. In 1987, I was teaching a workshop at Art New England, which was held at Bennington College. And I was teaching papermaking collage and construction for a week. And I walked through the printmaking studio and somebody was printing monotypes of umbrellas and the color they were using was this dark phthalo green. And I looked at that color and I just, I swooned. I was just like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful color. I'd never really thought about printmaking. And then about four or five weeks later, when I got back from the workshop, Bernie Toll and his partner had bought a printing press and they had a printmaking workshop. So I went to that and it was monotype. And I kind of hated it because it was really oil-based ink and brushes. And the people that were in the workshop were painters and I couldn't control it. And it was messy. And I thought, oh, I really hate this. I'm not, I don't like this at all. But I'd brought a piece of netting that I'd made. I used to make nets out of thin wire with a fisherman's, like a little netting shuttle from Japan. And so I had this piece of netting I made that I just thought, oh, I'm just going to like take a brayer and I'm going to roll ink on this and I'm just going to print it and see what happens. And then I did that and I was really amazed at the process. And then that was really my entree into printmaking. So the things that I ended up teaching at the college level are things that I have no training for. 
for some reason. I kind of studied myself or figured it all out also with bookmakings. So that's kind of what I've been doing and continue to do now. I love that you're pointing out that the things that you have been teaching <laughs> were technically things you didn't have training for, because that's encouraging to everyone that you can, if you can get your own hands in there, you could train yourself maybe. I think also now it's more structured. I mean, I feel like it's much more stratified. I mean, people are trying to, you know, there's a movement to have PhDs in studio art practices, you know, so I think it was this moment where I could be an adjunct. I mean, I could never be a full, you know, faculty member because I, I never really got a, an MFA, but I, you know, I kind of wiggled in under, under some board and got to do that. And I, I taught at Mass Art part-time for almost 30 years. It was good. And you're describing yourself as feeling that you always were an artist, even when you were younger. And that it, it wasn't necessarily acknowledged in your family in that way. Did you have ways that you could meet that need for yourself or projects that you worked on or were you a drawer or? I feel like I didn't really honor it all that much. I mean, I feel like I never felt that I drew really well. I, I felt like I didn't know how to draw. And I, I really liked games. I liked puzzles. I liked things that you could make patterns with. I liked sitting under blankets. <laughs> I liked sitting under blankets with lights coming through. So I, I remember we had this blanket and if the light was on and you were under it, it was like this amazing yellow orange color. And then we had this little tartan blanket that the light would make the colors glow. I took a class when I was, when I went back to art school, it was about aesthetics and inner, inner geographies, the topology of aesthetics. And you had to really think about early aesthetic experiences. And I feel like I had a lot of them, but it was just with me. I mean, I am of the age that we had a little like record player and the records were different colors, like yellow see-through and red see-through. And I just used to love to sit and look through the records you know, look at what, what things look like. So I think that I provided myself with some experiences and I, you know, and my house, I grew up in a little ranch house. My mother was very, very neat. You know, we had crayons and we had coloring books and we had a little bit of paper, but we, you know, occasionally we would have Play-Doh, but she always had everything up and she had to say, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. The other thing I did when I was little was I, would cut the knees out of my pajamas. I had an aunt who was a nurse, a surgical nurse in New York City. And she, and we had these amazing like surgical scissors. And I remember sitting and I'd take the knees of my pajamas and I'd fold them and I'd cut and I'd get a diamond. And that was amazing. And I did that to probably three pairs of pajamas. And then my parents gave me paper. So then I started <laughs> to cut snowflakes and I feel like cutting paper has been you know, something I've really liked doing. And, you know, I, I used to do paper cutouts when I lived in Denmark. And, um, and then I started to do stencils for, for printmaking about, you know, 20 years later after those initial experiences with that. So I think it was always there. And I think if I had been born in a different family or a different time, I probably would have gone and gotten art training much earlier than I did. But I feel like it, it came around when it, you know, when I felt like I was brave enough to try. So, so I did. And people were kind to me and I've been teaching people for years. So I sort of feel like it's the ripple keeps rippling. It's fun to hear these stories because it seems like color awareness is a theme. Like you're very color mm -hmm. aware. Yeah. Who are some people who have really been inspiring for you along the way, right when you started to go to our school and feel that calling? and like really get on your path? Well, I feel like when I was even younger that MC Richards was a bit, her book Centering was a seminal book. I took that with me when I went on a program to Denmark in 1972. And then in 1986, I took a, I was privileged to take a class with her at the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts with a friend of hers who was a Jungian analyst and dance therapist. And it was called Words, Movement, and Clay. And that was the first time I heard about Paulus Berenson and bookmaking and poetry. And so that workshop was really a big turning point in my life. 
And that's when I started taking writing workshops. It was also a really difficult time personally in my life because the man I was living with a couple months after that was a random victim of a violent crime and he was shot and lost an eye. And then 12 weeks later, my dad died. It was a terrible, terrible time, but I felt like I got this boost from the summer of this totally new direction. You know, I, I stopped being a paper maker and I kind of jumped ship from fibers and really moved into printmaking and, and writing. People who have been inspiring to me for a long time is there's a South African artist, William Kentridge, who is both a printmaker and has done a lot of theater work. And there's some wonderful lectures. He was the Norton Poetry Lecture giver at Harvard in I want to say like 2012 or 14. And he's really a master with video and ideas. So he gave these lectures and I went to each one of them. And he, he has beautiful animated films of his drawings. And so he's done lots of like theater and different kinds of multimedia presentations. He's had like shows at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He's really an interesting thinker. And he also says, you know, that art is not, just inspiration. And it's not just you have this idea that you follow. There's this blending of both of those. And I felt like when I heard him talk, his process, even though, you know, he's like a world famous person, his process and how he thinks about stuff is pretty much how I do it too. There'll be luck and there'll be some little random thing that strikes you. And then that's the direction you go in. You have been teaching for years, all ages. How about you tell us a little bit about your approach and philosophy to teaching? Okay. Well, I've taught everybody since I worked with in an early intervention program with kids 30 months. And I've probably my oldest student has been in their 80s. I have a degree in early childhood education from Tufts University. I learned a lot about intellectual development. And I feel like the way people learn is... I don't want to say it's basically the same, but I feel like how kids explore the world with materials, that's very similar to how I hope people will interact with materials when they take a workshop with me. I feel like when I'm working myself, I really want to try to surprise myself. And I feel like even though I've been an artist for so long, I don't have a really strong internal visual sense. I have to see things in my hands and know if they're good and then keep working from there. It's not like, oh, I have this great idea and then I'm going to draw it out and, you know, I get sort of little inklings of things in the world and work with them. But I really, I think providing people with good materials, interesting options, and that you can be a beginner and have success easily and then keep working from there. Like I try to encourage people you know, that there's many, many different pathways to get somewhere. I think one of the things I really love about printmaking is there's so much variety, you know, like you can, you can make many different moves with a monotype or cutting up an acetate stencil and you can use everything in really different ways and just keep working. And then something you're going to like something, and then that's going to like put you on another path. I think it's a philosophy of opening up possibilities. And I mostly work with adults now. And I feel like it's really brave for people to take a class in something that they know nothing about, that maybe they are just interested in art. Or I feel like my demographic most recently for teaching are there's, I have retired lawyers and art teachers. And then I have a lot of women who had careers and now they have kids and they have a morning free and they'll come and do printmaking and they've had an interesting life. And now they're trying to re-establish something of themselves, you know, besides, you know, all the demands that they have in their lives. So I feel like it's, it's having the goalposts be really low and just keep working, you know, if you can, however you can do it. And, you know, and I feel like people who th they think they want to be an artist, but they don't have time. You know, I feel like make your goal the littlest possible thing you can do. Like maybe you're doing a postcard a week, or maybe you're, you know, maybe you have a whole bunch of tiny little papers and you, you make yourself draw for 15 minutes or, you know, just do something, create, you know, something 
like you add all of those things up and you have an accumulation, you know, and, but if you don't do it, you won't have it, you know, but I feel like it's easier to chunk it down into the smallest increment that makes sense. And I also just feel honored when people take time out of their busy lives to come and take a class with me because it's not easy. Everybody is very, very over-programmed, over-scheduled. And I say to people, if they're taking a woodcut class, you know, if you have to just come and no pun or pun, carve out these like three and a half hours for yourself and all you can do is carve right now and you have no time to do any work outside of class, that's fine. You know, it's just you know, that you're here and you're taking this time for yourself is really what's important. I love that mix up and all of that is the goal to surprise yourself. <laughs> yeah, really. Cause I have a, an old, he's older, a man who is an architect in my studio. He rents time and he really wants his prints to look exactly like his photographs, but there's nothing surprise. I mean, I feel like he's, there's nothing surprising about what he does and he's a little bit stuck. And I think he knows it because he doesn't want, it's almost like he doesn't want the light to come in, you know, because if he didn't see it, he doesn't want it to be there. So it's almost like, I mean, I think I know this from writing and editing and doing collage and, and it's all kind of the same process is like, you have to you know, you make things and then you have to let the, the work cool down and then you have to look at it dispassionately and say, well, yeah, I really love that piece of pink paper, but it really doesn't go there, you know, and take it, cut it off or, you know, sort of make your frame a little smaller and, you know, and then there'll be something else that will appear, but it's, it's going to be, um, you have to change things, you know, it's not going to be like a one for one correlation what you have in your brain, it's going to, you know, instantly be down there on the paper and be perfect. Yeah. What's perfect anyway. Exactly. (laughs) You have dear friends in all different countries and you've traveled so much through the years. Do you feel like the travel plays a part in your creative life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When I was a young sprout, I got to live in Europe for three and a half years. I lived in Denmark and I lived in London and I have had the privilege of being able to go back and visit those places repeatedly. And I, I also, about 11 or 10 years ago, I had an artist residency in Ireland and very, very remote Donegal. And I have friends there. And so I feel like I would travel every year to renew myself, you know, seeing people. And if I go to London, I would go to museums a lot and see my friends. And I lived and worked in a big community arts organization in in North London in the 70s. And so those friends are still my friends, you know, and I'm like an aunt to their kids who are grown up now. And so they're like my family. I don't have I don't have any family here. I don't have any kids. I don't have a partner at the moment. I don't have, you know, I'm pretty alone and I have a dog. And so I've really counted on those connections to nourish me and sustain me. And COVID has made that really hard. You know, I have Zoom visits and WhatsApp visits, but it's it's not the same. You know, it's not the same to be able to be somewhere else. And also, I've always been an urban dweller. And I'm really surprised that there's landscapes in rural Ireland that just, I just love to be there and walk and just be in this totally different environment. It's important to me in a way that I didn't really understand until last winter I read this book about gardening your mind. And it was, it was written by a psychiatrist about the importance of gardening and nature in people's lives. And there was some part of that that really connected to me in terms of why I really like to be in remote County Donegal in Ireland, where it's very kind of rough and the sky is big and there's nothing around, you know, you can just walk and you won't see anybody. And it's very particular and unusual for me, but I, but I understand that now. And I feel like I really miss that. Do you take a sketchbook with you and collect ideas and, or do you take a break from all that? I think more recently I, I take a sketchbook and I usually write and I also take pictures with my phone. 
I mean, I have that, but I don't really, I don't think I work from that that much. You know, I feel like that's more about memories. You know, I think I'm going to use things, but I usually don't. I like having, I mean, I like looking at what I have to remember where I was or that I have this continuity in my life between going to these different places and, you know, kids get bigger and things change, but I'm more kind of haphazard in terms of how I make my artwork and something will just strike me an idea or, you know, this past year I've participated in things through online, not just, um, I'm a member of LA printmakers and ZMA studio, which is a, a studio in Western Massachusetts and LA printmakers just had an exquisite corpse project. So I made like a t- three 15 by 15 prints and sent them off and they're at some museum in California. Uh, I had also participated in this Phoenix project, which was from the Harvard Divinity School. And it was an international art project about what was happening with COVID and the fires and Black Lives Matter and, and sort of the positive energy of the Phoenix rising again. And so I made prints, woodblock prints of phoenixes. And that became a a really integral part of this project. And people in the East Village in New York and around Boston, they did wheat paste graffiti of my images and like pasted them up all over the place. And I made stickers and people could upload or download my images and print them out like at photocopy stores and, and then paste them up if they wanted to. So I've liked to, I like to participate in things and and I've never really thought about myself as being really a gallery artist. Like I'm, I'm sort of on the edge of community art, but also participatory art. And I think about my teaching in my studio as being in a band, you know, so you get to be creative in a creative space with these people for this limited you know, period of time. And you're kind of in it together. So I like that. You're also one of the only Americans I know that speak Danish. That's a very rare thing. (laughs) I know it it is rare. And three years ago, I had the privilege of taking the Penland Friends to Denmark on a tour. I did a 10-day tour. Jean came, and uh, who's the former director of Penland, and I led 22 people around Denmark for 10 days on this tour that was about craft, art, design, city planning, and food. And every time we were on like public transportation and I could speak Danish to, you know, the train man, he would say like, did you live here when you were a little girl? You know, were your parents Danish? And then you, then you moved to the States, you know, it was, it's, it's always very, very surprising, but yeah, it's a mystery to me <laughs> that, that I can still do it. You know, like I can just, I say that I have this drawer in my brain and it can open up and just speak Danish. It is an amazing thing. And I admire it, especially because, as you know, I lived there for six months to go to a sports folk and school. dance folk school. And within those six months, I learned how to say things like potato and rye bread and stuff. <laughs> and it just it's just not an easy language. Um, so anyway, I'm very always been impressed by that. <laughs> yeah, I will say talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> What's filling up your inspiration cup these days? I know it's been isolating for you during these times. What are you doing to help you feel like that excited, inspired feeling? Um, I read a lot. I'm a really voracious reader. That's more just keeping myself sane. I mean, I listen to audiobooks in the studio and I read novels. I feel like the way the world is a lot, I, I want a story to be lost in. I've been inspired recently by um, looking at Francisco Clemente's work. A couple of years ago, I went to this museum, Mass Mocha in Western Mass, and he had a big exhibition of tents that he had created in India with a family of tent makers. And so they were painted inside and embroidered on the outside. And I bought a book by him. And, and I think his work is really wonderful. And so I you know, I looked through that book and I saw some things that I used when I did my exquisite corpse magic man piece. And I, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty inspired by looking at Instagram. I'm surprised that I even say that, but I started to be on it a year ago this summer. 
I think because of COVID and just feeling isolated. And there's an international community of printmakers there. And so you can see pretty interesting work, but I've liked doing that. And, and I've taken a couple of classes on Zoom from the Studio ZMA's printmaking in, in Florence, Massachusetts. I took two woodcut classes in the wintertime, and it was mostly just to have a, some people to talk to about craft. And then I recently took a dry point class, which is something I, I always hated dry point. I didn't like, it's a kind of printmaking technique where you have to incise plastic or metal and then you have to rub all this ink on and wipe it off. And it always felt stupid to me, like it was too messy. And now there's oil-based ink that you can clean up with water. And it seems to be, maybe I'm just better at wiping things. It seemed better, easier. And also people were using a lot of upcycled plastic, things that would just be thrown away. So the tops of lettuce boxes or any kind of coated paper you can incise and use for a dry point plate. I also really like when I do wood cuts, I never use the rectangle or square. I always kind of cut away. So I have a layer of a pattern or an image that I can put on top of something else without, you know, having the edge. Like I really hate the edge. And so this other way of doing dry point, I could cut plastic or cut shapes and not be, you know, oppressed by the rectangle. So I've kind of really enjoyed that. And I also have been raising monarch butterflies from eggs that I found on my milkweed. I have, I'm an urban gardener. I don't have a backyard. I have a big garden on the street and we've had, well, we've had a terrible scourge of bunnies. I'm like, I have, we have so many bunnies that it's really horrible. They're, they're multiplying like rabbits all over the place. But anyway, I have a lot of milkweed and I tried for two other summers to raise butterflies and I failed. And then this summer, there was a woman from Tufts University that was studying the milkweed in my area. And she came and talked to me and she told me like what kind of eggs to look for and what were the eggs that maybe weren't fertilized. And so I have, I've had butterflies that I've raised and released from just tiny little eggs and then they become caterpillars and then you feed, feed the milkweed and they poop and they, you know, eat, feed, eat milkweed and poop some more. And then they go into the chrysalis and then, and then eight days later, they become a butterfly. So it's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And I just found two more eggs this morning. And, um, and the totally amazing thing is that the monarch life cycle is that during the summer, there's four different cycles of butterflies that happen. And cycle one through three, the butterflies live for four to six weeks. Cycle four, the butterflies live for six to eight months and they fly to Mexico. And, and you know, you need all those other butterflies for it to happen. And so I have one chrysalis now, and that might be one that is flying to Mexico. And then maybe my two eggs that I found this morning, maybe they will maybe they'll go to Mexico too. So that's amazing. It's amazing to me. So that's, that's been uh, just fascinating and a, a nice, nice thing to be checking out. And I'm doing a wood block of the Caterpillar. There's also a really nice printmaking magazine called Pressing Matters from England. And, um, and last issue, they had a I guess a competition that they were going to have an insert that the colors used were red and black or red, black, and white. And so I did a whole bunch of red and black prints. You know, I didn't, I didn't get to be the insert, but I got to do the prints. And then um, a couple prints from that series, I got to have in a magazine called The Hand, which is a magazine of printing, printmaking, and photography. And now Pressing Matters has a yellow and black competition. And so I'm going to do a you know, I'm doing the caterpillar. So the monarch butterfly caterpillar is yellow, black, and white. So I might do dry point leaves. So that's what I'm working on at my studio. And I don't really know what I'm going to be doing with there next, but I'm also um, working on this project that I've been working on for a couple of years. I'm making a book that's going to be an index of my wood blocks for the past 20 years. Well, now it's going to be the past 23 years. So I'm working with a graphic designer who's a book designer. And I, I had a, an intern from Leslie University a few years ago, and we 
we printed all my wood blocks. And so I got them photographed and it's going to be an index. And Karen Kuntz, who's a very wonderful woodcut artist from University of Nebraska, she has Constellation Studio. She wrote the introduction to it. So it's it's happening. I'm self-publishing it. And I guess you will know about it when it happens. So that's that's probably about it. I don't really know. Well, that's you know. some good stuff. I'm just thinking about those monarch butterflies. And also, I was going to ask you if if that imagery was coming into your work. And it's also so amazing to publish an index, like you're saying, and go through all your past blocks, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. So over how yeah. many years? Well, it's probably 20 years. It was going to be 20 years. And now, you know, with COVID, I mean, I, I think I have 20 more blocks. I mean, I got them all photographed. We started this in 2018. And then John, the designer had, you know, he was very busy and nothing. And then it was COVID and then nothing happened. And so we, we are going forward now. And then also he wanted it to be a larger format. Like he wanted it to be block size. And that just seemed financially like it wasn't going to make any sense. So we're, so it's going to be nine by 12 and COVID also like there's lots of paper you can't, I mean, there's lots of things that are difficult all along various supply chains. So we're kind of in process. Now my next job is to print the newest blocks that I have and get them photographed and probably do a little bit more writing, but it's a long time, you know, it's, and there's a lot of blocks and, and I use them. I mean, I don't use all of them, but I keep using certain ones. And then I always like to make new ones. I mean, I love carving. People should just carve. It's, it's destructive and constructive at the same time. And if you listen to a story, somebody's reading to you. And it's really one of my real happy things that I get to do. I can't wait to see it when it comes out. That's a really yeah, big project. It, it is a big project. And I think what made me think about it was that when I've had shows, I've installed my actual wood blocks. Like I might have a wall of the actual blocks and they're really if I say so myself, they're really beautiful objects. And then you get to understand, you see the blocks and then you see prints and then you can find elements in, in the prints from the blocks. And then it occurred to me that it would be neat to have a document of all of them, if I could. That's where the idea came from. And I used to be influenced by, there was a man named Antonio Frasconi, who was a woodblock artist who lived in the States and he had indexes of a lot of his woodblocks. He'd have an index of insects or animals. And I remember seeing a show of his work in New York and being really uh, blown away that he had all these things that were the same that he had carved. And so I think that's where the idea initially came from. So, you know, we all know life can be hard and crazy and all those things. And I was wondering if you have some last words of encouragement for anyone trying to make and do and create in the middle of it all. I would say just if you can possibly try the littlest possible thing, you know, it doesn't even have to be every day. It could be every week, you know, to have a time for yourself where you either get to look at something that's pleasing for you or, you know, have a small piece of paper and draw or collect things. I mean, sometimes, you know, having a new sketchbook and gluing things in or, you know, looking through your old stuff and recycling things. I mean, I feel like you can't share if your cup is empty. And I feel like you have to keep putting drops in the cup, even when it feels like it's really, really hard to do that. So I feel like there's this in and out process that happens that you have to kind of you know, feed yourself a little bit and then, you know, give out a little bit more. And I think sometimes also it's, you know, like, I feel like it's good to, if you like to read novels, like don't apologize for it. You know, like, and it's a time to be able to nurture, like need to be a little bit protective of yourself in this very unstable world, you know, so I don't, I don't really watch scare. I mean, I watch if I watch something on Netflix or something, I, I kind of don't watch things that make me scared. I mean, I watch things that, you know, I, it, it, everything is too scary. So I feel like if I can try to not be scared in certain ways, like I will do that. So I, I feel like it's being part of the world, but also if you need to protect yourself, you know, and if you have people that you 
love around you. Just acknowledge that and be with them in a kind way and pet your dog and see, you know, if there's beauty around your, your house or your life, kind of, you know, look at, look at that and keep walking. Walking is a good thing if you can manage that. That's my recipe for sanity in these insane times. <laughs> and every drop counts. <laughs> every drop counts, right? Yeah. It's like you, there's a book by Lewis Hyde, The Gift, Imagination, and the Erotic Life of Property. And it's like you can't, if you turn off the tap, it's hard to start it again. But if you even keep it trickling a little bit, you know, it will keep, you'll just keep going. Right. And it's also how you keep your pipes from freezing. So that's also another nice side exactly. of that metaphor. Exactly. You yeah. keep your pipes from freezing. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. You know, like if you've got that, if you've got the urge, if you've got the making chops, it doesn't matter how old you are. And it's timeless. You know, you can, you can make things until you only have one more breath in your body. And I feel like that's, that's a big gift. I mean, that's the gift. Well, thank you for being here. And I look forward to talking to you more soon. Okay, sweetie. If you would like to be in touch or have someone you would love to hear interviewed, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. I also hope that you're inspired to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. New episodes come out every other Tuesday. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fane House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards from my watercolor originals, I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You will also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If this all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly backslash Fainhouse to sign up. That's with a capital F and a capital H in Fainhouse. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. You can find this link, as well as links for each person I interview, in the show notes of each episode. I'm Annie Fain Barillon. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll leave you with a quote for the day. All the arts we practice are apprenticeship. The big art is our life. M.C. Richards. <laughs>